So hey everybody, uh, it's Rob Daywald again. This is Juvenile Justice Module 6. Uh, in this module we talk about the process of actually um, having children in court, the whole procedure for the courtroom, uh, and then also uh, there's specifically in the discussion uh, there is a, an emphasis on the waiver or transfer process. So what I'm going to do is touch on some of these things. First of all, I want you to understand, I've been getting a sense from some of you that you think that the child uh, that gets arrested uh, goes to juvenile detention and then is immediately released to their parents. You know, that is not always the case. In fact, frequently uh, the child ends up locked in detention uh, longer than I've seen some young adults uh, sit in jail, quite frankly. Uh, they say uh, in an article I read from the Washington Post uh, that I posted in the, my uh, comments this week uh, that 70,000 children every day are locked up just in detention alone. This is not in boys school or some other program. That's another bigger number. I'm talking about just kids waiting to go to court. And I found that even though the minority of kids are in fact kept in detention and the majority are released to go home. Uh, kids that are facing some serious charges can end up being locked up for quite a long time just in their county detention center. Now some places they don't have county detention center anymore, they have a regional uh, facility uh, that they take uh, kids to, uh, but uh, it's all basically the same thing. It's just a holding uh, pattern more or less where kids are taken out of society and then waiting uh, for the court to determine you know what to do. One of the things I also always want to stress with you is don't forget that children just like adults are innocent until proven guilty. So don't assume that just because a kid has to go to juvenile court that he's automatically guilty. Uh, and it's probably kind of rare it seems like, but children are found not guilty uh, or not delinquent. So that is a consideration. Always keep that in mind. Don't just jump to the conclusion uh, that they're going to be found to be delinquent. Now the different states vary and I found that it's interesting in the module 6 comments uh, that are posted by the people that created this course uh, that they refer to Chen's cases as, uh, which is children in need of services, as what uh, we in Indiana call uh, unruly teenager. And uh, that's a different category altogether. Chins in Indiana are children in need of services. These are children of abuse and neglect. Child molested children, for example. Uh, children that are beaten uh, till they bleed on their behind. I've seen this many times. Um, and so CHINS means different things in different states, apparently. I know in Massachusetts that they started classifying cases this way, uh, where if a, if a child is truant, if a child is a runaway, if a child just will not listen to his parents, frequently he is classified as a CHINS. Uh, in Indiana, that's still a delinquency in, uh, uh, offense, and I believe that's true in Ohio, uh, where um, uh, the difference, though, is that you can't be sent to boys' school for that delinquency offense. Only cases that can be sent to boys school or uh, adult processing are crimes. In other words, uh, offenses that would be a crime if the juvenile was uh, an adult. Well, there's some essential requirements in every case as it's being processed uh, and what we would call due process. And you know, what does due process include in juvenile court, okay? Well, uh, the big thing, the big difference is there's no jury trial, okay? No jury, okay? And that's important, I suppose, uh, for some people. Uh, it's, it's not that big of an issue uh, for me. Uh, sometimes juries can be part of the problem, not part of the solution. But anyway, that is an interesting uh, aspect. Uh, also, as I've said also uh, earlier, no bond in juvenile court. And so I've seen kids, let's say, that are 19 uh, get arrested for shoplifting and end up paying a bond of, let's say, $450, whatever, uh, and just walk out and that's the end of it. They never go back. 
Well, that kid might, uh, if he's 15 or 16, same offense might sit in detention for 30 days uh, just because of that. That's his punishment. So uh, there's a big difference. Uh, a young adult might be put on probation, um, whereas a, a juvenile might be held actually longer because of the fact that there is no bond. So that's, that's a pretty important aspect of it, too. Now, uh, some things that are the same, of course, are the kind of Miranda things, which is the right to an attorney, the right to testify or not testify, You can also call witnesses, that is, subpoena witnesses. And uh, then also, uh, you have the right to cross-examine the state's witnesses. I'm just going to put an X for examine there. Now one thing also is uh, that's a modern uh, requirement of all cases is what we call discovery. And what that means is the juvenile has the right to know what these uh, documents are, uh, records and so forth, that would indicate what a witness might say. And those can be critically important um, in cases that I've had. Uh, sometimes people forget what they told police and they make some big changes in their story. Uh, for example, I had a guy in court one time told the police well, no, I couldn't identify the person because I didn't see his face. That's what's in his statement. We get in court and the, and the prosecutor says, do you either see the person in court that robbed you? Oh, yes, he's sitting right there. Well, that's not uh, proper, and obviously that case was thrown out because I confronted him with his own statement to the police where he said he could never identify the person that robbed him because he couldn't see their face. So these are just some of the things that, that you can see that you run into from time to time. And so basically, if there is a trial, it is a full-blown trial, just like in adult court. Now, there is another thing, too. Uh, all adult cases are open to uh, the public. And so what that means is you can drift in. They used to say that farmers would drift in on their way to pay their taxes uh, just to watch a jury trial for the entertainment. Uh, and so a lot of times your courtrooms uh, would be full of people. Whereas today, you almost never see anybody in there. And in juvenile court, you don't see anybody in there except the juvenile and his parents and maybe the opposing uh, victim and a uh, few people like that. Uh, different states are, act differently on this. Some of them open up the court. Anybody can walk in that wants to. Uh, other places are very uh, circumspect on that. They're very limiting uh, on the court process. A big thing here, and we're going to need to go and move over to it in order to make it uh, all fit in the time slot, but one of the things is that the uh, waiver or transfer procedures that are mentioned in your um, notes, in your uh, comments, uh, vary a lot from state to state. Now, for example, I put in my comments uh, the direct uh, file option that they have in Florida. And that means the prosecutor has the option in Florida just to file a case in adult court, just ignore juvenile court. Uh, and all too often that's happening, and that's the problem in the article that they're talking about uh, that I posted for you. Is a lot of uh, you know, minor offenses are being transferred to adult court, which is basically ruining these kids' lives uh, because they're being treated uh, as adults and sent to prison for some things uh, that would be handled differently in juvenile court. Uh, generally speaking, in the states where I'm, I'm used to it at least, uh, there is a process that is required and that is that uh, there has to be, of course, there has to be uh, probable cause, okay, so what we call probable cause. Uh, there has to be some proof of efforts to rehabilitate the uh, juvenile. Uh, there's also like an age requirement, let's say like 15 or older. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, basically what they have to do is show that the efforts have failed. So basically what they're saying is there's really nothing more that juvenile court can do. Uh, so basically what they're saying is juvenile court has failed this young person. 
and so they need to be uh, processed in the adult system. That's the traditional way of what we call waiver or transfer into adult court. Florida obviously has this wild uh, modern uh, experiment that they've been doing and uh, just about everybody in the country bemoans this as being a terrible thing uh, to try these kids as, as, as adults. Um, I know that some states are trying uh, some middle ground there so that where a uh, juvenile can spend so much time in the juvenile facility but then be transferred when they reach 18 to the adult facility for major crimes. Problem with that is an issue with double jeopardy. And if you want to do a little outside research and comment, uh, and if you need a few extra credit points, I'll consider this. Uh, find that case that says that it is double jeopardy for a child to be uh, found delinquent and then transferred to uh, adult court. Because the process I'm familiar with is that uh, all you do is you find probable cause. You don't find that the child's delinquent. You never do that. If you find a child is delinquent and then say you're going to transfer them to adult court, that is double jeopardy. That is the essence of double jeopardy because they've been tried in juvenile court. They're supposed to be processed in juvenile court. They're supposed to be sentenced in juvenile court. So that's a sticking point right there in some states. Now, I don't know how they're getting around it because it's a U.S. Supreme Court case and folks, another thing you really need to know is if a U.S. Supreme Court speaks on a matter of law, then that's the law for the whole country. It doesn't matter, uh, like someone has said before, well, uh, maybe we should uh, try these juveniles as adults for murder and give them the death penalty. Can't do it because of Roper versus Simmons. Same way on the life sentences now. You can't give them what we call LWAP or life without parole. Uh, because they said that that is cruel and unusual punishment for a child. And as much as you don't want to hear the word child, uh, you know, another thing that Roper and some of these other cases have said is that until somebody's 25 years old, they're really not fully developed. Now that is kind of an oxymoron to me because you've got a kid out here, you're going to recruit him into the Army. Back in the day, they were drafted into the Army. They go over, they get killed, they kill people. Uh, they come back a hero like Audie Murphy, uh, and yet uh, they're not fully formed or fully developed as an adult. Uh, so it's, it's, um, I think it's a changing times kind of thing, is that people's attitudes are slowly changing. I think that girls like 13 years old want to dress up like they're 35, and you know, boys they want to go around and act all rough and like they know everything when they're teenagers. But the honest truth is they don't know everything. They don't know very much, truthfully. And so I can kind of come down on both sides of this argument. If they're not 25, they're not fully developed. Um, but as for now, it is the law of the land because the Supreme Court says it is. Well, I hope that these things have helped you a little bit. I know it's uh, difficult with these short uh, lectures, but I'm trying to give you at least a feel for what it's like to be uh, in the classroom and get my... Uh, thoughts and experience on this after uh, the number of years that I've worked in this system. So uh, uh, I'll be waiting and interested in your comments. Uh, so I uh, look forward to hearing what you guys all have to say. Uh, and thanks for watching.